Yes, now we're alive. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, to, thank you for joining us tonight. Okay. Let's see how much of this we can get through. Pasha Zachlacha is a very interesting Pasha, a Pasha that has many, many facets to it. Stories of Ramavinu, getting to know of Ramavinu, what he was all about, what he stood for, etc., etc. And tonight, I'd like to speak about a few different things. Some of the things may be more political than the others, but let's see what happens. There is an interesting question that's asked by Nachmanides, by Ramban, at the beginning of the Sedra. We all know that the fa- there's actually a very famous story about Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu comes into this world. He starts to think to himself, there must be somebody that runs this world. It must be the sun, because the sun is the most powerful thing that he sees. And then at night, the sun disappears, and it's the moon. It must be the moon. And the moon disappears, and the sun comes back up, because, well, it can't be the sun or the moon, because they seem to be competing with each other, but neither of them seem to be very, very strong. So he moves on, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then at one point or another, he comes to the realization that it is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that there is a God, there must be somebody that runs the entire world, and that being, that entity that runs the entire world, he is in charge of everything. Right? Again, when I say he, it's important to realize I don't mean he in the masculine. It could be she for the same. God is not male or female. I think if to, if we were to say God was male or female, it's a misunderstanding and a uh, total perversion of what God is. Okay? So I think when people use the word he, it's just a, how do we say it? It's a figure of speech. It's not because we're assigning a gender to God. And if anybody thinks that we are assigning a gender to God, they've misunderstood the concept of God entirely. Okay? So we have... Avraham Avinu says he has discovered God. And he's in his father in his father's house. His father had a big shop of idols, and he breaks every single idol, and then they come in and they say, What's going on over here? Why are all the idols broken? And Avraham Avinu says, The reason these idols are broken is because, and he tells them the story, what happened? One of the, they, all the idols started fighting and the biggest idol then beat up all the other idols and he killed them and he put, he left only the biggest idol standing. He put in the idol a uh, hammer of some sort and this father said, oh, that's ridiculous. Don't be silly, Avram. You know, they can't move. They can't do that kind of thing. They don't have any power. He goes, aha, they got you there, right? You know, if they don't have any power, why do you serve them? Really, Shiva Mohan. The father doesn't really take well to this. They take him to Nimrod, who was the king at the time, the emperor. They try to kill him, etc., etc. And there's all this argument between him and all the people that are the idol worshippers. And now you have Avraham Avinu being thrown into the furnace. He comes out of the furnace. He comes out alive. Big miracle, etc., etc. And yet the Torah does not mention a single word about the entire story which sounds very strange because this is a very important story. I would have thought this is almost a pivotal story in the history of the Jewish people, and yet it's being entirely ignored. So how do we understand the fact that this is such an important story on the one and on the other hand it's being ignored entirely? Okay, so Ramban says something very interesting, and I think within this lies a tremendous what we would say in Hebrew is called yesod. It means a tremendous root or a, uh, how would I put it? Root is a, it's not really a root. A yesod is really a structure, but it's, it's the um, foundation in so many different things that we see in the world today. Says Ramban, you know why we didn't discuss all of this? And specifically, we didn't discuss idol worship and what the idol worshippers believed in, what Avraham Avinu believed in, how they had arguments, etc., etc. He says because the Torah wanted to minimize discussion about idol worship. And therefore, because the Torah didn't want to discuss worshipping idols, the Torah just stuck it out. That was it. He says, if you look further back in the Pasha as well, not in this week's Pasha, but when you read in the times of Enosh, you'd be in Bereshis looking at page. Just one second. You'll find it. We'll be page 22. Because what we have is the story of Cain and Abel. 
Cain kills Hevel, then Cain himself gets killed by his great-great-grandson, which is a fellow by the name of Lemech. And then what happens is Lemech also gets killed. And then Adam has another child, and he calls this child Chase. And Chase has another child called Enosh. Oz huchal likra b'shem Hashem. Then to call in the name of Hashem became profaned. That's what he says. Meaning, people started worshipping idols. But he doesn't really speak about idol worship there either. He doesn't tell you what they did and how they did and when they did. It's just, by the way, that's when they started worshipping idols. So Ramban says, you know why? Because we just don't really want to discuss the subject. There are certain subjects we don't want to discuss. And I think it's really important because if we speak about this idea, I want to sort of broaden this out about certain subjects that we do discuss or that we don't discuss. For example, I remember Rabbi Beryl Wine, who is my Rosh Hashiva, he used to say that the first movie, he spoke about Hollywood. By the way, the people that made Hollywood were all Jews. The Warner Brothers and uh, Metro Goodwin, you know, there were all these different people. They, as he told, he had a book, I, I remember when he spoke about it, he said there were literally a whole bunch of Yidin. They all put it together. They were the driving force behind Hollywood. And they were putting out the movies, etc., etc. not surprisingly. And what was the first movie with sound, if I remember correctly? That was the one. The Al first, Al pardon? Al Johnson. Al Johnson. Al Jolson, yeah. with what? What was he? Yeah. The first movie with Charlie Chaplin. The testing. No, no, I think there was, was, was that with no. sound? It's yeah, called, the first one. No, I thought the first one, maybe it was a color, first color one, I can't remember. No, there was, I think the first movie, I think at the time that he said, the first movie that came out that had sound was the jazz singer. Yeah? yeah. He was a cousin. Um, Al, yeah, that's the one, so Al Jolson, the jazz singer. There we go. Yeah. yeah. The first movie with sound with the jazz singer. What was the topic? Of the first movie in Hollywood with sound. What happens in The Jazz Singer? There's the elderly Chazm, yeah. and he has a son who's married out, and he's very, very disappointed and upset about his son, and they've cut ties, etc., etc. And then what happens? Then comes Yom Kippur, and Al Jolson can't daven for whatever reason, and he's got nobody to take over. And whom does he call to take over? His son. He doesn't have anybody to take over, so he calls his son, and his son becomes the chazan for Yom Kippur. And that's the movie. What is the subcurrent of that movie? What is the subliminal message in that movie? Intermarriage is okay. That's the subliminal message. That is why this was the first... You know, if you have Jewish people, and in this case, very secular Jewish people, that are running Hollywood, that can decide what they're going to put in front of their audiences. It's a tremendous power, by the way. Because you really... The people that own media outlets are very, very powerful because they can shape the ideologies, they can shape the thoughts of an entire generation. And so now you have all these people and they're watching this movie and it's all about intermarriage and it's all about how in the end of the day he needed this fellow and yes, okay, yeah, you know, he intermarried, he shouldn't have intermarried, nebuch, nebuch, but he needed somebody to be the chasen, so he became the chasen, right? And the more you speak about it, the more it becomes okay. And I was just recently, I was having this conversation with somebody who is a, uh, well, he's the deputy headmaster in a school, in a very religious school. And they're having tremendous issues with Ofsted. And the issues that they're having with Ofsted is that Ofsted would like them to teach about protected characteristics. And they said to Ofsted, they said, look, you know, we would maybe teach about protected characteristics, but we don't teach about sexuality at all. We don't teach about men and women either. You know what I mean? This is a topic that we don't discuss. We don't broach it in a from school. Not men and women, not men and men, not women and women, not exactly not transitioning, none of that. We don't speak about it. No, you have to. It's important, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Now, they had this whole conversation, and I, I can see where this conversation is going, although not everybody agrees with this. 
that the more you talk about something, the more acceptable it becomes. Mm. And so you look at today's society, why is today's society so sexualized? Why is everything about men and about women? Take out a phone and scroll through the songs on Spotify. How many of them have to do with relationships? And how many of them have to do with other mundane topics? Regular pop culture, most of their songs are about love. It always has been, since, since, forever, since forever. Since forever? Yeah. I don't think classical music was about love. You listen to classical no, music? There was no, really? no, 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 well, opera, no, maybe not even opera. No, even uh, opera, no, you, know, no, you, can, you have Romeo and Juliet, maybe, you know, you can, you can bring no, me Romeo, but, but you know, was, you didn't have this same... This was as popular music since, say, the 1920s. Yes. Straight away, it was songs about that kind of thing. Okay, and it keeps on going. So, yeah. therefore, it becomes something that we talk about. But in years... In the 1920s and the 1930s, I remember when they said in the 19... I, mean, I wasn't around, I remember. I wasn't around, right? <laughs> but the 1930s, when Gone with the Wind came out, oh, yeah. and that was scandalous. He had kissed her in the movie. Yeah. And he leaves and he says he doesn't give a damn. Mm. That was scandalous yeah. in those days. It was considered a really, really off movie. Today, what kids can watch at 4, 5, and 6 o'clock in the afternoon, 30, 40 years ago, would have been something that they would have to watch at night. It wouldn't be acceptable. But we spoke about it, and we spoke about it, and we spoke about it, and we spoke about it. It becomes more and more acceptable. Now you hear little kids, 11, 12, 13-year-olds in school already, you know, they, they know about sexual relationships. Not only that, they're all experimenting. Why? Because everybody talks about it. So if everybody talks about it, we have to get involved in this. I don't want to be left out. Who's going to say, I'm going to wait till I'm 18? No, who's a loser to wait till they're 18? The more you talk about it, the more it becomes a topic of conversation. The more it becomes a topic of conversation, the more people pick up things that they shouldn't pick up, and the more it turns into something that becomes like almost a national pastime. So we talk football, great. Let's talk football all day long. Now, so then my, my kids were telling me, what a waste of time. You know, if he'd gone there and he'd gone there and he'd done this, you know, you can understand you're watching a football match. That's wonderful. That's great. Why not watch a football match? Enjoy it. But after the football match, all the speculation. Yeah, you know, but if he had gone left on that pass instead of right and he had run and it would have been offside, that would have been the game. But no, they didn't do it. What do you think? Well, I think Arsenal could have done better than today. They could have done. They didn't do. They did do. They did do. They got a better new manager. Their new coach is going to take them a long time to get over Arsene Wenger. They are getting over. You know, the whole, do you know how they do it? It's, it's all speculation. A friend of mine once said to me, he's, uh, he had a conversation with a boy in yeshiva, and he said to the, that, that boy, he says, why don't you learn? He says, I find it very hard, this whole speculating everything. He goes, well, who's going to win the Premier League? There's about six games left. He goes, listen. Depends. If this happens, then that, you know. And the guy gave him, literally, he gave him such a Gemara talk about who's going to win the Premier League and when they're going to win the Premier League. It depends. If they win the next three games, but they lose the next two games, and the other team wins three, and they, but they, you know, and this is the goal difference. And he, he gave him such, he said, and you're telling me you don't have the cup for Gemara? It's what you're interested in. So you talk about something. So great. You know what? Even though it's a waste of time, it's still better to talk about football. Let them at least talk about football. But when we get into conversations about things that don't need to be discussed on a constant basis, things that should be more private, things that we should actually have a bit more, we should be holding back on, and instead we open it up to become a public conversation, the problem with that public conversation is that it creates a certain familiarity with the conversation and it creates a certain amount of almost, it normalizes it. And we suffer from that. We suffer tremendously from the fact that a lot of these things have become normalized. And so therefore, the society at large that we see today and the corruption that we see in the society at large today is based on the fact that so many people that we've normalized so many things that should have been spoken about only in quiet. Not that it shouldn't be spoken about. Of course you should teach children. You should teach them what is appropriate, what's not appropriate, how to treat your wife, how to treat your husband, what is an appropriate relationship in a bedroom, what is not an appropriate relationship in a bedroom. Of course that's important. 
We as Jews, we were the first people to talk about sexual education because we teach them the halachas of Nida, but we teach them also the halachas. Any chos and any kala gets taught what it is and what it isn't. We've been doing this for generations. We're doing this for millennia, actually. So that they came on the scene 10, 20 years ago and says, I think we should bring it into schools. We're like, no, don't bring it into schools. We can teach it. We've always been teaching this stuff. It's important to teach this stuff. Just don't bring it into schools. What are you doing with bringing it into schools? That means the whole class is going, oh, this is what sex is all about. Let's try and figure it out. That's all it becomes. And the same with many of the protective characteristics. The more you speak about it, the more it becomes a normal topic, the more people think this is what they need to be in order to be normal. Somebody's told me that in a school, here in a local school, he says there are very, very few people that will tell you that they're straight. I'm straight, but I got 10% of this and I got 5% of that. Everything, you know, everybody's a little bit, a little bit this, a little bit that. They're cherry picking everything. Because we speak about it so much that you know, if I'm not a little bit that way, that must be weird. Something must be wrong with me because we're constantly discussing it. Why do we need to discuss it? It doesn't need to be something, you know, you have whatever it is, you know, especially in, you know, in this case, in a very from high school, they just, but they don't understand it. You're talking to the officer inspectors and they're like, no, you have to teach these things. But we, we, we don't teach this. We're not teaching any of this. We just don't think it's right for our children now to be having these conversations. They are not going to be engaging in any sexual relationships until they get married. So when they get married, we will sit down with them and we will give them the you know sexual education that they need. But not now. Not now that they're 14. Why do they need to know at 14? So then they're not going to take. They're going to take on until 22. It's irrelevant. It just makes for a discussion, frivolous discussion about things that they don't really need to speak about. That's what the Ramban is teaching us. Certain topics, it's better just to keep away. You open up the can of worms, people start talking about, it becomes a conversation. Once it becomes a conversation, it's very, very hard to get the genie back into the bottle, and it's very, very hard to change people's attitude. And the conversation and the attitudes that people have are based on how many conversations they have about it. Okay? That's the first thing. That's, a, you know, I felt very strongly about that. Pardon? Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Now, we have, the Pasha starts with the following, and this is a very, very important point. It says, Vayomer Hashem al Avram, Hashem says to Avram, Lech lecho, go for yourself, me'atzachom yomalatom, me'savicha, from your land and from your birthplace and from your father's house, ala'atz hasha'arecha, to the land that I will show you. What does it mean, lech lecho? So Rashi says, lecho, you should go for your own benefit and for your own good. And I think it is very, very telling that the first conversation to be had between God and Avram, because we've never had any conversations. This is the first conversation recorded between God and the first Jew in history, because Avram Avinu is the first Jew in history. Yes, there are conversations between Adam Arishan and God. Noah had conversations with God, maybe others, but this is the first conversation between the first Jew in history, Avram Avinu, and God. And what is one of the first things that God says to him? Lech lecha. This entire journey is for your benefit. It's for you. It's not for me. And this is such an important point in our entire view of Yiddishkeit. What Yiddishkeit is and what it isn't. Well, what's Yiddishkeit? Do you know God decided to punish us, to give us all these laws, to make our lives awkward? Can't eat wherever I want to. Got to go pray constantly. Can't do things every Saturday that everybody else does. Why did God make it so awkward if he chose us as, you know, if we're his chosen nation, he should give us like free range. Do whatever you want to. You're my people. Take it easy. Kach be easy. Why not? The answer is, is we start off with this right from the start. Lech lecha. The mitzvahs are there for your benefit. The relationship with God is there for your benefit. The entire world, this world and the next, is there for your benefit. And it's got to be that way because logically speaking, God is, as we understand it, infinite. And therefore, if God is infinite, you cannot give him anything because if he was lacking, then by definition, he wouldn't be infinite. Right? That's just... Regular, I guess, logic, God logic, as we say it. Yeah? And therefore, it can't be for God's purpose. We're not doing this for God. But rather, God said, I'm doing this for you. Well, okay. 
If this is for me, then how do I look at it? Lots of things I do for me that aren't such fun, but they're for me and so I need to do it. Talk health. You know, sometimes you gotta go take some tests. And even as little kids, I remember when you used to have to get injections. You ever take little kids to injections? Oh, what fun. <laughs> My wife always sent me to do the injections. There are certain things she says, this is your job, go take them for injections. I guess, I, I, I won't say I'm callous, right? She can't bear to see them suffering. No, she can't bear to see them suffering. I don't, don't blame her. You know, yeah. Hashem, she's a good mother. I have the same thing. Yeah? yeah. And so therefore, they, they can't bear to see them suffering. They said, you go. Not that I like seeing them suffering. But as a man, I'll sort of say, okay, you know what? I don't like seeing them suffering on the one or the other. And I know they need to have this injection. Okay, let's do it. Hold them down. Hold her down. They're screaming. They get the injection. But afterwards, they'll give you a hug and they'll come out and they'll, they'll forgive you and that'll be the end of it. Nobody's ever fallen out over an injection, right? Well, Hashem, they get over it. And as they get older, it gets easier with the injections also. I think, as, I think when we got older, people said, if you just take it easy and ignore it, then it doesn't even hurt. If you make such a big thing, oh! You know, you know, these, these kids that start screaming, I've not even put the needle in. What are you <laughs> screaming about? It's the anticipation. Yeah? Do you know anticipation? I know with my kids, you know, if you if you tickle them and they're laughing, and then you go you go back for the next tickle and you go, oh, and they're already laughing just when you're doing this. Why? It's the anticipation of being like, and then they go, oh, even if you just get near them, ha, ha, they're they're laughing their heads off. Why? They're anticipating that laugh. So when you get near them, it goes. That's the same with the uh, with the injection. You're like, oh, it's gonna hurt. It's gonna go. Ah, it hurts. <laughs> Whereas if you say, okay, look, it's a little prick. Okay, that's what it is. It was a little prick. Sometimes it gets very uncomfortable. You know, as you get older, if they can't find your veins, they have to prick you plenty of times. Here, no, 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 we can't get you. So it's not very comfortable. I'm not saying it's always going to be so easy. However, you take your kids to injections. Why do you do that? Why are you taking your kid and putting them through this awful ordeal? Of getting, here's a little kid. What do you want from this little kid? Why are you bringing him into this doctor surgery for some woman he's never seen before to go boom? Oh, how's that right? The answer is why do we give our kids injections? We need to build up their immune system to be immune to certain illnesses. It's much worse for them not to be immune to these illnesses and God forbid to get these illnesses. That'd be much, much worse. And so I say, I know it's going to hurt you. But I'm doing it anyway because I love you. It's not going to be always fun, but it's going to be for your benefit in the long run. And with mitzvahs, that's how it is. Sometimes it'll be easier. Sometimes it'll be more difficult. Not every mitzvah is easy. Not every mitzvah is fun. Shabbos is great. You know, we have Shabbos. Low signal. Don't steal? That's not fun. If you know you could fiddle the taxes a little bit, you could do a little here, you could do a little there, and you make a lot more money that way. It's hard. Now, if you're not making a lot of money and the fiddling the taxes is going to make you another 20 pounds, so you're like, uh, whatever, right? But the 20 pounds is not worth it. But there are people that own big, big businesses. And those people that own very, very big businesses, if they fiddle the numbers even just a little bit, it could be a massive, massive difference for them. And all they need to do is forget a little zero here or forget a little thing over there and hope that the IRS, if they do it well, that the HMRC is not going to catch them. And that's it. That's hard. That's already a real temptation for some people. I'm not saying I'm tempted to do that. I'm saying, but you know, I can understand the temptation and I can understand the difficulty in that. The difficulty, other things that could be difficult. But God is saying, all this, it's not for me. It's not because I'm sitting here in heaven saying to myself, what can I do to get more out of these people? What can I do to squeeze them a little bit? What can I do to make their life a misery? I got it. Sitters. Fill it. This is, a, this is just going to ruin everything for them. It's. It's not what it's about. I said, this is for you. I'm doing this. I've created this entire system to be there to make your life better. And after a while, once you start getting into things and realizing 
how it works and what it does, it does enhance your life. And you start enjoying, some people, they'll even start enjoying not stealing. They will, even, <coughs> even without that temptation of thousands and tens of thousands of pounds. They'll still say, I like doing the right thing. I enjoy being honest. I enjoy doing it and not fiddling the taxes. Do I love paying taxes? No, I don't love paying taxes. But we all have to pay taxes. We all pay our fair share, unless you're called Amazon or Google. You know, you, <laughs> yeah, we all pay our fair share. So that's what it is. You pay what you have to pay. But there's no price on honesty. It's worth it to me for that. And that is the other thing that we need to learn over here from, from Avraham Avinu. Lech lecha. Go for yourself in the first conversation all the way through. This will carry you through any conversation you have about the Torah. God says the entire book is about your benefit. It's about things being positive for you and you getting the best in this world and the best in the next world. Okay. Now we move on to the next pasuk. I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. Whatever that means, will you be a blessing? That's a separate discussion. So, what does it mean? I will make your name great. Because Rashi says what happens is when you go on the way, when you travel, three things happen. Number one, it's hard to have children. Number two, it depletes your money. And number three, when you get somewhere else, nobody knows who you are. If you move to a new place, you might be a big macher in your old city. But if you move somewhere new, you know, if we move to London tomorrow, you'd be a nobody. You'd have to build yourself up again from scratch. Find a community, find people that you know, make new relationships, make new friends. But, but for a while, you could be a nobody. Don't move somewhere. So God says... I see you're going to go somewhere else and you stand to lose something. But ask other God, God, you think you're not going to have children? I will make you a great nation. I'll give you children. You think you know, your money is going to get depleted from the travel? Travel is expensive. Moving is expensive. All the expenses that come with it. And I will bless you, meaning I will give you money. Number three, you're going to go somewhere else. You're not going to be a well-known character. You won't be that Rom Avino that everybody knows. And I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing for, all, for everybody. Says, there's another Rashi. There's a in, in another place where Rashi says the following: The Eschal the Goy Godol. I'll make you a great nation, and then Vavarecha, and I will give you money. Vagad Loshemecha, and I will make your name great. Says Rashi, there's an important distinction to be made over here in the order that these things are quoted here in the verse. What comes first? First, God says, I'll give you money. Then, God says, I'll make your name great. Why is it in that order? Explains Rashi with a verse from Kohelis. Tov, shame, mishem and tov. It is better to have a good name than to have good oil. That's a bit of a uh, literary play over there. Tov, shame, shem, and tov. Sounds a little bit, you know, you play around with words. So it sounds poetic, but there's a much, much deeper meaning there as well. Which is, God says, I'm going to move up in levels of blessing. Money, wonderful. Great blessing for some people. Not for everybody. Some people, but God says, I'll give you an even greater blessing than money. Do you know what an even greater blessing than money is? And that's what Koelis tells us. A good name. It's brought in Pirkovus as well. Shlosha Kisarim Heim, the three crowns. Kesa Torah, Kesa Kehuna, Kesa Malchus. Torah, Kehuna, priesthood. Malchus, kingship. Which means not only there's two or three people that are kings and everybody else is not no get to this mission, nobody really has any connection to this mission. What it means is Kesar Kehuna, when you speak about I'm sorry, when you speak about Kesar Malchus, it means money. The crown of money. The Kesar Shem Tov. But the crown of a good name, Al Gabe. It's even more important. 
And that's what he says over here as well. And what that means is the following. You can have very, very wealthy people. But who are they considered in the community? What are they? Sometimes you have very wealthy people and they are really looked up to within the community. They are the pillars of the community. They are the supporters of the community. They will put their money where their mouth is. They will make sure and ensure that a community runs straight. And if there is a deficit, they'll be of the first people to put their hand in the pocket and to make sure to somehow minimize that deficit, to shrink the deficit. If there's something that needs to be done, they will get behind it. And oftentimes, some this is just the way it works, people tend to listen more often to people with money and then they listen to people that don't have money. He's a macher, he's a gans a macher in shul. Yeah? Now, am I saying this is right? I'm not saying this is right, but I'm telling you that seems to be the, uh, that seems to be the way it is. The reason that Rebbe, the one who wrote the Mishnah, was not only the greatest Tamil Chacham in his day, but was also the wealthiest person in his day, was that he would have the influence to be able to write the Mishnah. Because nobody could turn around and say, Ugh, who's this Rebbe guy? Yeah, he's a Kolali in Amman. He wears a Sekvechta suit and he wears a hat that's been that's seen better days 10 years ago. He looks like you know, his hat's been bashed in 20 times. It's got stains all around and his suit looks totally dirty and he doesn't have the money to pay for the right cleaning. And, you know, I'm not being, you know, I'm not being stereotypical. I'm just trying to blow things out of proportion. Look very put together, and people that are not that don't look put together. But be that as I may, you know, people might make all these comments, and his shoes are shiny or they're not shiny, and look, they need new soles and this or that. You no, know, this guy who stands in front of everybody, he's going to tell us what to do. He's going to tell us the halach. He's going to tell us what's right and wrong. Nah, not him. So God made him the wealthiest person in that generation. And therefore, when he stood up and he said, this is what the Torah wants from us. This is what the Mishnah says. This is what God wants from us. People said, okay, I get it. Nobody's going to get up and say, nah, if he had money, he wouldn't write that. It's because he has no money. So he's writing this whole, he gets into this whole Torah thing and he's being very self-righteous, et cetera, et cetera. If he understood business, he wouldn't have said all these laws. Oh, he understood business very well. He was the wealthiest guy around. He knew good and proper how to do business. and then. He says, this is still more, and this is still the more. That's an amazing thing. So you can have money and be a somebody. You cannot have money and also be a somebody. Now, I'm not saying that's what I'm saying. You don't have to be a wealthy person to be a mover and a shaker, to be a somebody, to be somebody important. You can be somebody with very little money, but still be somebody very important. They're not mutually exclusive. But what is important to mention is, if you have a choice, <coughs> if you have a choice between money, no, just move over. Brian, Brian, we have one more seat here. If you have a choice in life between money and between a good name, Make sure you choose the good name. Because a good name is always more valuable than money. What's it going to help you? You'll have this massive bank account, but everybody thinks you're a mamzer. Great. Wonderful. Lovely. <laughs> Nobody wants to associate with you. Nobody wants to speak to you. Nobody wants to have anything to do with you. Oh, do you know what he does? This guy reports people. He's a wuss. He's a this. He's a that. You know, people make up all sorts of things about others. And if you don't have a good name, so yeah, okay, you might have, you might have money. You might be able to buy yourself a nice house and drive a nice car. Who are you gonna share it with? Everybody thinks you're just a loser. <clears throat> it's more important, and that's what the Torah is telling us. It's such an important lesson. Again, God's giving you a level of, he's telling you, if you have a choice between two things, between making a big amount of money, but then being an outcast to society and everybody considering you a terrible person. Or on the other hand, you can make a lot less money, but you could be 
somebody important. It could be somebody that everybody looks up to. A name is something that's much, much more important than any money you can make. And it's important that people should be aware of this and people should guard their name. You know, when you have people, defamation of character, et cetera, et cetera, when they try to get money out of other people for defamation of character, a big deal. So he said something about you. He says, no, 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 it is a big deal. Of course it is a big deal. If you've taken someone and you've ruined their character, you might ruin their business. You might ruin who they are forever. And that's really important. But we mustn't submit ourselves to, to the court of public opinion. Yes and no. Yes and no. On the one hand, meaning, if we went with public opinion only all the time, we would basically become a slave to the public. And that's true. That's correct. On the other hand, if everybody thinks you're a terrible person, that's also not a great thing. You wouldn't want to be known as a terrible individual, an immoral individual, um, in, you know, amongst everybody that you knew. And you'd say, well, okay, but I made a lot of money. And yeah, now I'm known as an immoral individual, but you know, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very wealthy for it. You're better off not making that money and retaining the, you know, who you are. You're covered, your good name beyond anything else. And so therefore, and that's why Agarish Baruch says, I will give you money, but more important than giving you money, I will make your name great. I will make people understand and know who you are. And therefore, that will be even more important for Avraham Avinu because Avraham Avinu, the reason people listen to Avraham Avinu is not because he was so wealthy. The reason people listen to Avraham Avinu is because people realize this was a great man. He had this wonderful persona about him. He had this great power that people said, this is Abraham. This is the famous Abraham. That's what made him effective, not his wealth. His wealth allowed him to then invite people to feed them, et cetera, et cetera, to create this hotel that, that gave, he had the ability to do that because he had the money to be able to pay for it. But even more importantly and more effective was the fact that everybody knew this was the man who stood for certain values. That was his greatest asset, well beyond any other financial asset he could have. Always ensure that you realize what's most important in life, that you keep your eye on the ball, not running after money, but realizing that a good name and a good character and people's, again, not submitting yourself to public opinion, public opinion but people, the fact that you are considered somebody good and somebody big is really, really important, well beyond the money that you could make on ruining that. Okay, thank you very much for joining us, gentlemen, and wishing you all a good night, and continue next week. Go. Oh, yeah.